someone is currently, you know, in the workplace and they're feeling some way of difference with, let's say, their boss and how their boss is leading in this remote environment, um, and maybe there are microaggressions or a toxic coworker or just a horrible boss in this era of this pandemic, you know, what advice do you have for them in actually sizing up the situation? Because I would imagine not all situations are the same. Yeah. Sometimes we amplify things. So um, there are there are a lot of things that we can't control. Right. And so it's a kind of acceptance of some of that. Things like horrible bosses or what people say, microaggressions, like we just you'll exhaust yourself trying to change other people. Right. But we can control what we do and how we show up. Um, and so and, and your perspective. That is probably one of two things that we actually have control of. How you decide to see things or the story that you tell yourself. Really important in this day and age to set boundaries. So many of us, too many of us, are so used to having these porous boundaries. Yes, you know, I only work until six, but there's this presentation I have to do, so I'm up until midnight doing it. Like, if you have a boundary, you have, to, you have to honor it. You have to respect it, right? That's the only way other people will listen to it, mm -hmm. right? If you're porous, you're training other pe people mm -hmm. to break your boundaries, mm -hmm. right? So boundary setting is more important now, setting and maintaining. Um, just as important now, more important now than it's ever been. Yeah, and I love the way you use the term porous. <laughs> I mean, that is so spot on because individuals I know that I've worked with think they have boundaries in place, yet they're telling me stories that reflect something different. And so that's an opportunity as a coach to step in and say, let's take that scenario you just shared. How in that situation are you supporting the boundaries you've put in place and inviting them to think about it? and discover for themselves that they're saying it, they're not doing it. Yes. And so what is the toll that individuals place on themselves when they stay in these situations for way too long without putting in place um, the boundaries? They aren't thinking about it in a way that's helpful. What's the consequence of doing that? The consequence is definitely like it, you're stripping yourself of your own personal joy and job fulfillment, but joy, joy because it's internal, right? Um, I hear many of my clients who in the workspace, they'll be like, oh, I'm so annoyed because my, you know, my boss is constantly sending urgent emails on Saturdays. And I'm like, but you saw the email, right? So which means you also were on the email. And so what what makes you think that on a saturday that you have to respond mm -hmm. or that you because that is a, an off day mm -hmm. you're like but if i don't then what will happen <laughs> and, and that's that's the the exercise that they have to go through right because probably nothing will happen in most industries mm -hmm. nothing will happen if you wait till sunday night or monday morning to respond mm -hmm. most of the time when people send you emails on an off hour, they want to get it off their to-do list. Mm -hmm. And that has nothing to do with you. Mm -hmm. Right? It's just when you're ready, here it is. Yeah. Right? Nine times out of 10, that's what it is. Yeah. So and we're putting a lot of stress on ourselves. But when we do it over and over again, it becomes real. The anxiety <laughs> becomes real. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we're reinforcing it. You know, yes. we're reinforcing it as opposed to acknowledging it, there's a pattern, and then how to prepare having a conversation with yes. that colleague, that boss of expectations and advocating for yourself. And this is one thing that I have found um, to be kind of a common theme with young professionals because they want to do well at work and they think that, well, if I don't do this, it's going to be some reflection on me. I'm not as committed to my job. They make up these stories in their mind mm -hmm. until you get to a point of having done it for year after year that you say, okay, this is just not working. 
I'm not my best self. And I've allowed this toxicity to kind of creep in at my porous boundaries. Um, conversation. <laughs> Absolutely. And I think, I think especially young professionals think if I'm honest, then I'll be thought of differently. Right. And it's actually the opposite. Transparency is really important. Yep. Telling somebody who's above you, especially, or even a peer, honestly, listen, when this happens, this is the way I'm feeling. Could you please do this? And asking for what you need is also really important because if you don't put words to it, you're asking other people to read your mind. And that's just not a human being thing. We yeah. don't do that. Right. There are people who are just naturally not mind readers. Not mind readers. They may think they are, <laughs> but just not natural. So, you know, so let's imagine a young professional is feeling um, some sort of way, not their best self, not feeling joy, feeling a struggle, a slug to get through, um, showing up for work. Others are telling them that there's something off. Mm -hmm. What are some of the signs that from your professional lens you offer for individuals to look for in their self-discovery of, hmm, I've hit a point, maybe it's time to get some support? Yeah, uh, definitely if, <clears throat> if the way you're feeling is getting in the way of your functioning, it's definitely time to reach out for some help. Mm -hmm. So if you are avoiding meetings or people, if you are avoiding just even getting up to get in front of your computer, if you're making excuses to have your uh, video off mm -hmm. because you, know, you haven't gotten it together, mm -hmm. right? Those are definitely signs that you're not able to function the way you normally would and that you should get the help that you need. Mm -hmm. Talk to somebody. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, professionals are there, professionals are there to help but it's not a lifetime sentence. If you reach out to a professional, it doesn't mean that you're in for therapy for a lifetime, mm -hmm. right? Sometimes it's very situational mm -hmm. and you just go for a little bit of time. And then, you know, once you get the tools that you need, there you go. then you're off. What are, what's a, um, an, an ideal scenario or an ideal individual, what characterizes an individual who's best served by you as a clinical therapist? Well, 100%, uh, they have to want to be there. Mm -hmm. right? No one can make you. No. Right? Same with coaching. I say no one can make you come into coaching. <laughs> you have <laughs> to you want have to be there. One of the first questions I ask at the end of an intake session is, tell me what, what brought you to therapy and if six months down the line, we're done, how do you want to be different? Mm -hmm. Because you have to have some goals, just like in the workplace, right? In the therapeutic setting, you have to have goals. You have to have something that you want to achieve because then that is also a source of motivation for you to use your tools. Many times I'll, I'll bring up meditation and I get either the eye roll <laughs> Or the, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, when I absolutely know they're never going to do it, right? And I'll say, if you want to feel better, mm -hmm. you should do this. Mm -hmm. It's no different than if you have an infection and doctor gives you an antibiotic, mm -hmm. you take it. Mm -hmm. So I'm telling you that if you want to be more present and stop your anxious brain from going too far forward or or kind of spiraling about past things, then you need to be in the present. And that's all about mindful meditation, right? Mm -hmm. So to, to be able to do that, and it's harder than it looks, <laughs> it takes practice. Yeah. It does. Mm -hmm. um, so the, these are things that I will, I'll say, but you do have to want it. That, that is the person that is most successful in, in therapy. Mm -hmm. um, also somebody who's willing to listen. Mm -hmm. So combination. You know, and I'm reminded as, as I hear you describe that of my career in the pharmaceutical industry with Eli Lilly. And I remember in particular for, um, you know, depression, some bipolar diagnosis that some in the medical community had just self-assessments that individuals could use before even going to see a doctor to say, hey, here's a 20, 25 
self-question, self-assessment of different markers and determine for yourself where you are because you know, one thing when people just listen to others on social media or family and friends and people just say, oh, I'm depressed or I'm you know, this, that, or the, or the other, what we don't know is that person's lens and the depth. So what resources are available for someone to just kind of maybe get access or get their hands on something like that? Or is that even used in today's environment? <laughs> it is used. There are probably too many resources out there. Uh, mm -hmm. um, but all they're all similar. Um, I so there's sometimes because the words depressed and anxious or have anxiety are very overused, mm -hmm. right? Um, so I just want to reiterate that in order for, to get a diagnosis, a lot of times it's it's over a span of time. Mm -hmm. So if you were to pull down like a scale for depression. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't do it one time and then say, oh my God, like that, that's who I am. That, that defines me. Now I am depressed. Mm -hmm. okay. It could be a really bad day, mm -hmm. right? So do it maybe once a week mm -hmm. or three, four, five nice. weeks. And if there's a trend, then maybe that's your proof, if you will, mm -hmm. that, okay, I need help mm -hmm. if you're not absolutely, you know, sure. Mm -hmm. but, awesome. but yeah. How does someone determine or identify a professional that's a good fit? I mean, where do you even start to find qualified professionals um, in the work that you do? Yeah, um, that's a great question. So there's a very widely used resource called Psychology Today um, that it, literally at the top of the page, it has a search engine for, um, for clinicians okay. nationwide. And so I always recommend that people start there because they have filters for insurance, no insurance, what your concerns are. So you can really identify clinicians that work with you um, or, or with what you're suffering from. Um, so that, that's a really good resource. You could always just do a general Google search. There is no one that you're going to find Okay, 98% of the time, that was kind of absolute. <laughs> Most of the time, you are not going to find your perfect therapist just with that search, mm -hmm. right? So I would highly recommend, like, don't commit right away. Have like a 15, 20 minute conversation with a couple of clinicians to really determine fit because there's so much of the work that's done in the mental health space that's totally dependent on the relationship between you and your therapist. Mm -hmm. Do you, do you vibe? It's kind of like a date. <laughs> like, <Right. laughs> do, do you vibe? Do you speak the same language? Mm -hmm. Do do you, do you respond to their tone? You know, some people, some clinicians have a very like soft, easygoing tone and that irritates some people. Mm -hmm. So you have to be able to, um, feel comfortable in that space. Cause I always say that space is the client's space. Yeah. That should be your like optimal place where you can be completely transparent and vulnerable. Mm -hmm. But the person mm -hmm. on the receiving end has to be somebody that you're able to be vulnerable with. Mm -hmm. so, so all the certifications are great and I have them and they're mm -hmm. great. <laughs> right. It just means that I'm educated, but that doesn't right. mean that I'm a good fit for you. Thinking of someone going to, um, a clinical therapist, what three questions should they have on their short list just to help people out in terms of good starter questions to ask in that conversation? Because some may really be going, okay, I don't even know what to ask them. Right, right. That's actually <laughs> a good question. Um, so questions that I've gotten that I think have gotten us to a, a good assessment mm -hmm. are um, definitely like fees. Mm -hmm. How much is this and what insurance do you take? That's a super important question. You don't want this to be an additional stressor mm -hmm. in your life. If it's going to break the bank, it's just not, you're, you're going to be so focused on the cost of it. You're not going to really be able to be in with both feet. Mm -hmm. um, and whether or not your insurance covers it is really important mm -hmm. um, to that fee. So that, that's, that's the first thing. Um, right now in COVID, 
are you in person? Do you do in-person sessions? Or would you do in-person sessions? Mm -hmm. Right? Some people, like me, I'm not working in my office, in my, you know, my formal office um, 100% of the time. But if somebody wants to do a walking session mm -hmm. outside, I'll do that. Okay. Right? But not everybody has that flexibility. So to ask that right now, is, I think, is really important. And then asking about what the clinician enjoys or who, what population the mm -hmm. clinician enjoys working with, I think is really important. It doesn't 100% of the time have to be exactly what you're dealing with. I think that'll be maybe a not so genuine answer. Mm -hmm. But it's important to know, like if I'm, if I'm coming in for couples therapy, does my clinician love to work with couples or are they able to work with couples and more passionate about adolescents? Mm. It's, you know, it's important. And you might be able to get some of that from their profile and what they do, but asking the question, I think was, is it lends to a lot more transparency. Great um, questions. The fee schedule, does insurance cover, or is it, what insurance is accepted in part? in person, virtual, possibly walking, um, and then what population do they, is it prefer working with, or do that is kind of their- What, what, pop, what population do they enjoy working with okay. most? Okay, nice, terrific. And so what additional thoughts um, or information do you wanna share with this prof young professional audience that we haven't had a chance to address yet, Danielle? Well, I think one of the things that I wanted to talk about mm -hmm. was um, the difference between all of the certifications, all of the titles, all of the letters behind my name. Um, Glad. <laughs> it, Terrific. <laughs> it's some letters, but at the end of the day, you know, I, and, and not everybody might agree, but I'm in the camp of if I'm looking for a therapist and one went to Harvard and one went to, I don't know, USC, mm -hmm. right? I'm not automatically going to go to the Harvard one because it might not be, that person might not be a great fit for me, mm -hmm. right? It's kind of the same thing with all of the different types of therapists. It just says where they went to school and what program they studied in. It doesn't really speak to their strengths. Mm -hmm. It doesn't speak to their capabilities and it definitely doesn't speak to fit, mm -hmm. right? So I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily um, focus in on whether somebody's an LCSW or an LCPC or it, give, give everybody a chance mm -hmm. and really identify the person for what they have to offer you. Mm -hmm. um, but the difference between a psych psychologist slash social worker slash therapist slash person, like mm -hmm. all of those things, of those, those, those are the people that are all on the same level and give you generally the same service. Psychiatry is a whole different animal and many people are afraid to go on medication for mental health diagnosis. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I understand, mm -hmm. right? Some have side effects. There, there's a lot to play with, but what I like to tell people is if a therapist recommends that you see a psychiatrist for medication, it's probably because you're having difficulty or they're seeing that you're having difficulty doing the work, mm. right? So, so medication, anti-anxiety medication or antidepressants, mm -hmm. once my client gets on medication, nine times out of 10, suddenly they're able to use their tools and they're able to practice the meditation and they're able because generally what I've done is I've pushed them away from the edge of the cliff with the medication, mm -hmm. right? It doesn't solve the problem, right? but it helps us to do the work to get there. Nice. Right. So I, I want to make sure that people don't see medication as like this dark, scary place because yeah. it really does work at, in tandem. Mm -hmm. with talk therapy. Yeah. And I think as we're seeing with the pandemic and just getting the vaccination, there are just some very polarizing, strong feelings when it comes to administration of, of any type of you know, medicine. And uh, I definitely saw that in my time at, at Lilly with um, 
you know, with, with depression and Prozac, some people just felt the stigma was too great. I don't want to take that. And um, I'm so glad, though, that so many um, high profile individuals are stepping forward to share. Yeah, you know, absolutely. And absolutely. to have their story told. So terrific. Well, Danielle, thank you so much for your time today. It has been such a ple pleasure having you and what a wealth of information for our audience. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. That's a wrap for this episode of Tuesdays with Coach Mo. Showing up here tells me you're willing to invest in yourself and your career. Get additional resources at TuesdaysWithCoachMo.com. Please subscribe and leave a review. I'd love to get your feedback. Till next time, this is Coach Mo signing off. Tuesdays with Coach Mo.